Hey there, Golden Bear family. Welcome to Module 3 7, The Legacies of the American Revolution. So, with that, as always, I want to start off with the story here. And, and this story deals with a trip, one of my first trips to San Francisco, uh, kind of in, in my little uh, mid 30s. Family wasn't with me. I was up doing a nerd conference uh, for the A Push uh, classes that I used to teach way back when. And, um, in the world history realm and had a week there and there were other staff members who said, hey, let's go have dinner at this one place that is crushing it. It's called the House of Nanking. And I'm like, yeah, let's do this. So we rolled up. It was, I think, a Sunday afternoon. And, and as we get to hit Chinatown, not two, two blocks in the Transamerica building there, um, we see a line forming uh, around the corner. And it looks to be about 15, 20, I don't know, 20 some people deep. And as I get up to the, the, the business, I see it's not a huge restaurant. I mean, everything in Chinatown is like, you can like build a place like in the size of a bedroom and they have four or five tables in there plus a kitchen. I'm sitting there looking. I'm like, folks, it's going to take us an hour and a half to get in there. And we just happened to be a group of three and, uh, someone went in, put our name in and we were standing out in line. I'm like, well, hey, we'll just roll with it. It's supposed to be like one of the best places, uh, there in, in, uh, in Chinatown. Sure enough, within like two minutes, we hear the guy's name's called, uh, name called, and, and we move up to the line and we're like, whoa, wait a minute. No, we got here. No one, as we walked past them, gave us any evil looks or like question what was going on. Basically, as we get seated and we're taking, the we discover that it depends not on uh, who arrives. It depends on what is the size of your group. And since we were three, there was a small little cubby that only handled three people, ironically. And we got that thought it was like sweet there's you know another cool story about this i got to know that the owner was there i guess he was a mission star chef and what made it rather unique is that you don't order he tells you what you're eating it's like the trippiest thing he comes in and he asks you okay what's some food that you like or don't like and you say i don't really care for seafood or i don't care for something with a lot of onions so then what comes back uh, it's just food after food after food. And you're like, that's incredible. What am I eating? What am I eating? What am I eating? You say, it was just such the coolest experience that Peter and the House of Nanking had created. Well, why is that story significant? And why does that relate to the legacy of the American Revolution? Is that after the Revolution, after the Articles of Confederation, after we had finally found a way to somewhat begin to solidify as a country, we began discovering this ideal of egalitarianism. That we're all equal. There's not one group that gets better service than another group simply because of their title or simply because of their wealth or simply because of their land holdings. This idea of egalitarianism would happen there right to us in San Francisco. It wasn't that we were better or worse. We just happened to show up with three people and we got seated. We're going to begin discovering how this theme of egalitarianism is a theme that runs constant throughout American history post the, the, the American Revolution. It's going to be something that we see that draws us into the Civil War. It was going to draw us into the industrialization. It's going to draw us into uh, the, this imperialism. You name it. It's going to be this idea that all of us are equal. Uh, some of us might have a better opportunity than others, but regardless, we have an opportunity to pursue that. And so some things that we need to be mindful of during this time period is that we're going to see how culture changes, but it also um, goes through some sort of similar things. We also see how slavery changes, yet also remains constant. We see the role of women changing, but how there's some new things that emerge. And so we'll discover kind of what those things recognize. So the first point here is dealing with veteran farmers, how they struggle post the war economy. We need to recognize, and hopefully in the prior lecture, you realize that America and the failure of the Articles of Confusion, the Articles of Confederation, is that there was no way to collect money from the different states. It was like, well, we hope they pay their bill, and discovering that none of them could. Maybe Virginia could because they had enough land to do that, but very few of them could. And so this created resentment amongst prior veterans who were promised that they joined in the colonial fight against the tyranny of, of England. They will be paid for this. Some of them taking close to 20 plus years to get made. The other thing that they're frustrated with is this proclamation line of 1763. If you remember at the end, uh, 1783, I'm sorry. If you remember at the um, end of the, the, the um, oh no, my date's right, 1763, that they had to promise not to go beyond after the French and Indian War past this line. 
and and this line kind of frustrated the Native um, Americans because tons of settlers were going beyond it. And it frustrated the settlers who say, hey, we bought in the French and fought in French Indian War. Shouldn't we be allowed to expand as settlers and create new uh, open land? And so both sides of them experienced de uh, frustration and sadness as a result of this. Now, on a side note, you need to recognize that this isn't the plugged in universe as we know it. Most people barely left 20 miles around their home and weren't clear as to what are the Articles of Confederation and what is the, 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 the American Revolution about. We just, you know, they have stories of, yeah, there was some changes taking place in Boston and those troublemakers were up in New York or in Philadelphia and others, but very few people were touched by that. They, they just were now interested in how can I expand and how can I not have the Native Americans perhaps infringing upon me and my rights of sorts. Excuse me while I turn down the, the volume of my, my phone. Well, we need to recognize that the government looks to the state governments to resolve this, and they're not too happy about it, because not every state has the capacity to be part of that journey. Well, let's talk about, so from farmers and the white uh, poor class, let's see how the role of women change and what remained the same and what was new to this. Sadly, um, post um, the Revolutionary War, we see um, women having um, little economic dependence um, from their their husband. They were tied to what they did, and many of them were relegated to being in the home. They Many of them could not own their own business. But based on the laws that England had determined, which we had adopted as part of our um, Articles of Confederation and soon to be the Constitution, um, we, we basically... Profit in land and business were titled in the name of the man, not of the woman. Women weren't even allowed to divorce uh, in terms of unless they had upteen amounts of wealth to do this. And so they were limited in moving and had to endure often some very challenging situations and abuse going on. And, and another thing that was moving as part of a cultural trend is this idea of Republican motherhood. You need to know this. You need to star it. You need to recognize that what is this that's basically kind of teaching the, the ideas of liberty and government to their children? Remember, Republican ideals are something that have been become strong as a result of the revolution. What is Republicanism? And this idea that the rights of the government go through the people, not the king down and or the queen or whatever that you know mindset is of the monarchy. And this idea was that the women's job was to pass on those traits in addition to teaching them, in addition to kind of scolding them, in addition to equipping them around the dinner table of how to behave, etc. It was called the Republican Motherhood, and it was uh, passed along to them. In today's parlance, I've used this jokingly sometimes when they asked uh, my wife, who's an author, but they're like, you know, what does she do? I go, my wife's a cultural engineer. She has been incredible at raising up our kids to prepare them for life. And, and she's just not some simple housewife. She is an engineer with what she's doing and has worked harder than most, uh, certainly men, in their day-to-day -day type of things that we're doing. And the final thing, we need to recognize that, yes, there are major changes. I'll talk about the next slide. That in Massachusetts, again, leading the way, the first one to have a legitimate um, constitution that is the longest withstanding constitution in the world in terms of how it was codified and written, where we have the, the power going through the people, okay, and recognizes the people. They also now are big on equality and an egalitarianism that women should have the opportunity and girls to go to school just as much as children. And so it made it very unique that the first public education system came from our dear friends there outside of Boston. Here's one perfect example of who can call a Judith Sergeant Stevens, a woman who um, married young, her husband passes away, marries into this universalist pastor who, who basically uh, believes that there is a cosmos, not in some typical congregational or some sort of Anglican belief system. And what made this unique is that she became a very prolific writer and an outspoken critic of how women should have opportunities to, to pursue and to grow and to, most importantly, be educated and express their thoughts and ideas. Love this painting that you have there kind of scandalous in some ways. In our day and culture, it's not scandalous, but can you imagine the power that this conveyed? And I'm sure the talk of the town amongst the women, oh my goodness, we can see her bare shoulder on these types of things. Incredible type of um, 
power statement that she was making with this. Well, what else was distinct going on in the American culture? We Again, we looked at you know, what was happening uh, there to the farmer. Then we looked at the roles of the women. Well, what's taking place across the landscape of America is that America is beginning to kind of wake up and, and, and have the rest of the world take note. And, and so we're trying to kind of establish our role of literature and the arts so that way we have civilization here. It's just not England. It's just not France. It's just not um, parts of even Germany. No, we can begin doing this. And so many states and national leaders beginning to push for public education. By this time, we have, I think, nine um, colleges had formed, uh, some, most of them private and religious, but one, the University of Pennsylvania, is started that is not affiliated with any sort of religion, which made it really a cool, legit public university. You also begin seeing some institutions in Massachusetts and Pennsylvania trying to edu uh, push people into technology or push people into medicine, etc. So this was a unique approach. Again, like I said, Massachusetts being the first to, to publicly offer school for children. And we begin seeing the arts influence things with the Enlightenment perspectives in, in their art, uh, where where you see the woman elevated in this Republican motherhood and the influence that she has in one of Copley's work, or you see these generals uh, post with their big, um, you know, breasts, breast uh, medals and everything and all the regalia there for us to see, and national symbols that I'll talk about here in another slide. The key thing you need to be mindful is, remember the Sons of Liberty and the Daughters of Liberty that were there during our revolutionary days? Well, they've still been at it. You're like, Part of our cultural identity is not tea. We're boycotting tea, remember? We're still continuing that. We want to boycott as much British product as possible. This is why Americans still drink copious amounts of coffee. We boycotted tea because that is identified as British. Let's embrace a new beverage of addiction <laughs> to take us off. Love this. I believe this is a uh, Samuel Jennings painting of here is the sweet mother liberty, if you will, um, where we're, we're talking about a, a woman teaching um, the classics, okay? Not necessarily the classics only to white kids. Look at this that's there. You see some African-American women, children, and men being taught. This is such unique and radical thought. Why was this and where was this capable? In the Quakers, because the Quakers believed the African-Americans, the Native Americans, all had souls and spirits and were worthy of of the image of God to be taught and cared for in such a lovingly manner. I love how you see the toppled over um, Corinthian column there. You see the kind of the, the art schemes to the left-hand corner and the books that have fallen over. Basically, they're dismantling the old in order to, and the old institutions to usher in new hope and opportunities for those uh, who are African-American or even women at this point. The next group of people that we have to examine during this time period is what was it like for those in the African-American community? And um, we need to um, recognize, I'm sorry, the Native American community. And we need to recognize that it's interesting that on one hand, um, we see them as noble people, meaning that uh, they are pure. They, 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 they're like the Iroquois Feder Confederation is they, they're able to work together, come unified together, that even women were in control of their culture society. So they seemed dignified and seemed, uh, just like I said, noble in what they bring about. And so American art uh, identified that as though the, the, the Indians, the Native Americans, were a good and wholesome community and a people group. Yet on the other side of things, if you were certainly living out in the hinterland or living out on the frontier, you saw them as barbarous and savage and ruthless and willing to kill man, woman, and child. Now, as we also know, that's very uh, myopic and, and slighted because we know often many of the um, colonists themselves that were the ones to lead uh, these battles against them first. And then now to slavery and its ongoing legacy that, yes, there were some... Remember the irony. You need to bear in mind that when the Declaration of Independence was penned and that brilliant... Uh, Thomas Jefferson was there at 31 or 33 years of age, uh, penning this and tasked with that. There was over a paragraph of how they wanted to emancipate the slaves, but to appease the Southerners that were there, sadly, those that language was taken out uh, of the Declaration of Independence. Yet there were still some states that have managed to keep this 
issue of slavery on the books in their constitutions to where it became a rather interesting thing that we'll talk about here in a moment. Please remember the British, um, they promised uh, the slaves opportunity to be freed after the war, and some went back with the, uh, the British and started new lives in England, but for the majority, many of them did not. We see the, Amer the church, called the AME Church, begin to establish itself, uh, which we're not going to talk much about that. We will trigger on that when we get into the fourth time period, but just recognize there's some movements of growth in Philadelphia, by now probably the second largest city in the colonies and definitely a very influential one in talking about the philosophy of how America is growing and changing and evolving. And there's a story here of where um, even in the North, we're beginning to see the courts support um, slaves in their freedom. One, for instance, Mr. Walker, he was promised uh, in a, in a um, when they pass away, I can't think of it off the top of my head, um, a document that basically said his slave would be emancipated, his will and testament. The man dies and his the family actually sells him to someone else. And he's like, no, wait a minute. It says right in this document. And sure enough, it went to the courts. Uh, it was found uh, supported in the courts. Then the lower courts of Massachusetts even supported it. It says, no, we believe that this is against the Constitution. This man should be let free. Another time, a Miss Bet uh, was promised the same thing by her employer. She also fought it in courts. And this is a unique thing that we see gradual, not for everybody, gradual change taking place in the lives of those in the African-American community. Well, what is this ongoing legacy of slavery? We kind of begin seeing the Southern states certainly not adhering to the call of those in the North, although small, remember. The North, they, they weren't moving with radical change, but at least the courts of Massachusetts were attempting to do this. Um, this is where we begin seeing this is the other side of America, down South, the other people group. And so um, the Southerners, we're not interested in, in adopting this. And um, this was a legacy that we're going to be seeing um, chronically as we kind of evolve into the 1860s and get closer to the Civil War. We need to recognize and never forget the Quakers uh, in that artwork that you saw of that woman there kind of educating them, uh, the Quakers speaking out against war, speaking out against the tyranny of, of the Constitution and the rights that they should have. Always the Quakers are there championing the rights of the marginalized people, and it's a really noble aspect of their group. So was America really egalitarian? Would we can say it was equal to all? Could we say that everybody can go to House of Nanking and be seated because they were the third, third party of three? Well, uh, it all depends, and it's up to you in terms of what you sense. Were the Native Americans given opportunities of egalitarian? Were the African Americans? Were the women? Um, what are the farmers? Uh, it's your call to begin making those decisions as we unpack here and things. And so with that, we, we come to a close, and we'll see you in the next video. Hey, welcome back, Golden Bear family. I hope you're well. Here we're at Module 3.8, where George Washington is called upon to lead a nation towards unity. A little illustration, if I will, and then I tell a funny little story. Um, the illustration is that imagine a, a ship has been set sail and that ship has been in the water for 13 years. Uh, what, what has it gone through? It's made it through the American Revolution. Uh, it has now made it through the Articles of Confusion and into Confederation. And now with the Constitution now emerging and the Federalists and Anti-Federalists fighting over it and discussing it, we now begin to see the mast being built on the boat for the first time. And soon the sails will be unfurled. And which way is this nation going to go? Is it going to go towards an agricultural uh, nation like Jefferson would want? Or is it going to go towards the other way, like Hamilton with a strong central government? Well, there standing in the middle is going to be George Washington, and people are going to be looking to him to try and help guide and make these decisions. Well, now a funny little story. Uh, it goes back to my very first year of teaching. Uh, I was uh, teaching at in Reno Valley High School. Go Vikings, I guess. Um, and uh, literally, I had a first period prep, and I remember I was living still to save money with my parents back in H-Town, and I was commuting in, but my first period was prep, and I was able to go to the gym. 
there and work out with the football players. That's just kind of what I was doing. And I was uh, just like kind of a, a timid place. Literally, Mo Valley was a rough, rough neighborhood and a rough area. In fact, the teachers had to park in a lot that always had a full-time person there watching their cars. Tons of kind of guards. I mean, I had just come from college. I'd come from this small, you know, as you know, little town of Hemet where there was rarely any problems back then, I should say. And um, I'm like, dang, this place is like serious, serious stuff. And I didn't really think much of it. The classes are going good. I was having a pretty good connect with the kids teaching world history uh, to them. But I discovered that there was one guy that kept eyeing me in the first period during the day. He was a Hispanic guy, really strong, uh, really certainly strong for probably a 16-year-old junior or maybe a senior, played on the football team. And I was, you know, getting stronger and doing pretty good. And one day Augustine comes over. He's like, hey, Holmes, what's your name? And I'm like, hey, I'm Mr. Vomsty. Oh, that's cool, Holmes. Do you mind if I, like, you know, work in here with you? And I'm like, yeah, sure, whatever. What's your name? Augustine, man. I'm Augustine. So he and I, the next couple of uh, days, uh, there worked out. And, uh, you know, he kind of, hey, Holmes, man, you're strong. This is cool. How'd you get so strong? Yeah, da, 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 da. I'm like, oh, and I was in trying to encourage him along. So finally, after about a week of doing this, Augustine looks at me. He goes, hey, Holmes, I've got to tell you something. You're all right. You're never, ever going to have a problem as long as you're on this campus. You're protected. My homies, we got you. I'm like, looked at him, I'm like, ah, cool. I didn't know I had to have such protection to work there. I lasted a year after that, like, bye-bye, you know. But Augustine, man, he took care of me. He hooked me up. This is kind of what many people were doing to George Washington is they were like, we need someone that has strong sense of power that's going to kind of take care of us in this midst of time that we were looking for both certainty and clarity. And it seemed to be as that Washington was the man, never asked for this. In fact, I'll talk to you about that in the next slide, but please bear in mind in your reading that Washington had to come up with an economic policy in order to stabilize the government. And he had to also come up with how are we going to look at the Constitution to determine is this going to be a government that is going to be loosely confederation or we're going to be under a strong central government to as we manage things. Well, he comes up with a way to organize the government that's based on uh, a cabinet. The Constitution did not forbid him from um, making a cabinet, but it also didn't speak into it. It just says, well, the cab, the government, the, I'm sorry, the, the president can turn to different people for insights and, and wisdom into things. Well, he took that to be, well, literally, what if I pick some people to help me govern? And so you have the Secretary of State, War, Treasury, and the Justice. Since that time, in fact, the most recent edition was in 2002, I believe, after 9-11, when President Bush, uh, President 43, had asked for the Homeland Security, which now governs most of America's secret agents to FBI, etc. right now. But these different presidents have come alongside and determined second, these, these executive departments to help them manage government. Some people like these programs. Some people are uh, disdain what these programs do. But either way, they're there to design some sense of um, agency to our government there and giving us help and, and purpose. The other thing that the president does is begins establishing this idea of what the Supreme Court should look like. And, and this Judiciary Act of 1789 has gone through three fundamental shifts. We're just going to kind of recognize this first one. And basically it, it says there are going to be men, sadly at this time men, uh, who are going to be elected into office for life. And they're going to go around as circuit judges and they literally have to travel. All right, from place to place to place to bring um, like judiciary practices to the frontier. I'm sure very few of them liked doing these types of things, being on the travel in those rustic and rural neighborhoods, but that's just what they had signed up for. And so this is why still to this day you'll hear about Ninth Circuit Judge, or you'll hear of the Seventh Circuit Judge, or you'll hear of the district courts that are there. This policy is still in effect. And the numbers of judges have come and gone based on different presidential uh, concerns. The last one to ask for this change was FDR. We'll get into that when we get into time period seven. But uh, you need to recognize this is an important measure that President Washington come up with in order for him to kind of help establish some continuity with this new constitution. The other thing that was going on was 
Jefferson and the Anti-Federalists were clamoring for a way to make sure that this government and under this new constitution will not become tyrannical. And so James Madison, his brilliance, he begins, he begins to look at over 200 different possible ways in which rights in England were uh, certainly taken from people. And he honed them down to about 12 or 13 of them. I forget the exact number. But by honing them down, this enabled the group of uh, men who were there to ratify them into becoming these Bill of Rights. Why were the Bill of Rights so important? It's because this helped pacify Jefferson and his Anti-Federalists and enable them to say, well, with these Bill of Rights, we can recognize that the central government can never get so big that our rights will never be protected. But specifically, you know, even the Ninth Amendment of that that basically says, well, if we didn't think of anything else of these Bill of Rights, we know that's all covered because the right to the person is there and protected in the Constitution. And so this is a very important document that um, needed to happen and has, and has been a significant document that still to this day, many of you are aware of your First Amendments or your Second Amendments rights, etc., uh, because they help uh, provide for us some means to protect. We, if we had more time to discuss, we would do this. This is what I'll do during the Steger Select uh, time. Well, at the same time, one of his cabinet members, remember we had war, uh, we had treasury, uh, we had uh, Secretary of State, uh, we, we have Hamilton showing up on the scene. This young, brilliant, 31-year-old uh, financial wizard uh, who was Washington's right-hand man through so much. Uh, he comes up with this idea that debt is good. Let me nestle down again. This little nugget. Debt is good. Here's the example. If you ever watch this, the TV show Shark Tank, what is it that everyone hopes to do as they pitch their thing? They hope to convince Mark Cuban to, or the others to invest in their strategy or their product or whatever they're going after. Why is that important? If you get Mark Cuban on the hook for debt, that guy's going to work extra, extra hard to make sure that he doesn't lose that debt. So if he invests $100,000, he wants to make sure he gets his $100,000 back plus the profit he hopes to get out of it. This is the same idea that Hamilton sensed that he never ever wants to have loans repaid to Britain or to France because he knows as long as those two countries are involved, they're going to want to make sure that commerce is happening, that the bank is happening, that there, that the inflation is curbed, that there's going to be equal trade and all these factors. A brilliant strategy that still to this day tells us why America is in five, five trillion dollars in debt and rising. Okay. Um, that might be way too far than what Hamilton had ever thought about, but this was a way in which he designed to help stabilize our economy and have other countries begin saying they're a safe place, who's there, that America is a safe place to begin investing again. His plan was to basically um, be begin using tariffs, begin using excise taxes, begin doing these creative things in order to um, raise funds one way. But the big thing that he went after is that he looked at Virginia and says, hey, thanks for paying down all of your debts from the war. Good for you. But the New Hampshire's can't do this. Um, the, the, the Maryland's can't do this. Um, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to basically go in and honor anybody who had any of those prior, con the, the, the continental dollars, I guess you would call them, during the American Revolution. Uh, we're going to honor those. And, and so this, this idea was met well by the states who couldn't pay them back. They're like, yeah, yeah, let's do this. And the Virginia's like, hmm, we don't like that. So what did Virginia do? They continually continued to work well for themselves. They wanted to make sure that Philadelphia wasn't going to become the power source that they sought becoming. They basically argued that, okay, we'll agree to this plan if you move the capital closer to us. So just on the other side of of Virginia right there was this new area of Norfolk on the other side is where the capital was built and this is what also will become an interesting point when we get into the Civil War and what that means for us as well. So compromise. Hamilton is compromising. Um, you see Washington is asking a compromise. Who stands against him is good old Thomas Jefferson and Madison. They believe that since the Bank of the United States, it's bus, bus number one, we'll talk about bus number two when we get to Andrew Jackson, 
Um, he believes, Jefferson Madison believed that there is no way the Constitution talked about this creation of a national bank. It should be left up to each state and those institutions. Why? They felt the centralized bank is going to be creating another tyrannical institution that nobody will ever, you know, smother or keep under their thumb. Hamilton argued brilliantly uh, against Jefferson Madison, saying, no, that all laws it says in the Constitution shall be necessary and proper to carry out the provisions of the Constitution. What does that mean? Well, we got to stretch with things. There's times in which we need to have a constrictive or a narrow interpretation, and there's time that we need to have elasticity. So based on that, Hamilton plan goes forward. Um, John Jay and, and President Washington are happy, and boy, you have the Anti-Federalists and um, Monroe uh, really upset with what uh, goes on. Well, with these agreements taking place, they decide uh, and, and begin declaring that we're now known as Washington, D.C., or Washington City, emerges right there between Virginia and Maryland. And, and, and we begin seeing tons of people emerging to be paid to, to work. Notice it's labor coming from uh, migrants or African Americans to do that, and not a healthy, easy place. It's swampland and nasty and all the rest of that, and so people die, aren't paid well for this type of thing. Sounds kind of familiar thing, but what's very unique is that different people representing different ideals of America. What is this ideals of America? Republicanism, my, meaning let's hearken back to Greece, let's hearken back to this idea of Plato and, and this ideas of right and wrong and, and, and good and bad and that, that raw laws are, are developed and put upon the people, not that uh, laws emerge from the top down, but from the bottom up. So these different architects brought their own different approach to the buildings and how things should look. Kind of a unique thing. And what is it essentially? We want to become as America a beacon to the rest of the world of what this Republican ideal is and what it looks like. And that we become, especially when we begin talking about the French Revolution in times to come. So to summarize George Washington and his new term, they look to him as that sail to be full, full of air and, and wondering where we're going in this uncharted territory. So his goal was to strengthen the federal uh, um, authority, yet there were detractors from that in Jefferson and, and Madison. And then this also led to some divisions within his cabinet, kind of based on how they saw things in the North and the South and kind of began ushering some future problems for us in that. So that's all we have for now. Uh, you know, go be good humans out there, golden bears, and, uh, you know, keep it real.